Welcome to uh, the Authors at Google presentation of Another Science Fiction by Megan Prolinger. The late 1950s and early 60s were the golden age of science fiction, an era when the farthest reaches of imagination were fed by the technological breakthroughs of the post-war years. While science fiction writers expressed the dreams and nightmares of the era in pulp print, real-life rocket engineers worked on making space travel a reality. The imaginations of many Cold War scientists were fed by science fiction literature, and companies often promoted their future capabilities with fantastical, colorful visions aimed at luring young engineers into their booming <laughs> workforce. Well, engineer anyway. In between the dry articles of trade journals, a new visual vernacular sprang up. Aerospace industry ads pitched the idea that we live in a moment where anything was possible. Gravity was history, and soon so would be the confines of our solar system. Another science fiction presents nearly 200 entertaining, intriguing, inspiring, and mind-boggling pieces of space-age eye candy. I, I can tell you this is true because I have given this book to a few people as a gift. It is a gorgeous book. Um, uh, it has been widely praised, in case you don't know that or didn't read the email I sent around. William Gibson said it is a brilliant tour through the iconography and literature of America's grandest corporate dream time, the space age. The uh, prop master for Mad Men said that he wished he had this book when he started Mad Men. It is a concise visual historical reference of mid-century advertising, unique and beautiful. Jonathan Lethem, the author of Motherless Brooklyn and Fortress of Solitude, called this book stupendous. And one of the founders of the science of rocketry, uh, uh, who was uh, on the rocket team that actually built the U.S. space program and consulted with Stanley Kubrick for 2001 said, and I quote, to the author of this remarkable work must go well-deserved laurels for rescuing rocket space ad artwork from visual obscurity, virtual obscurity. Megan Prelin Prelinger's book is a treasure that should find a worldwide readership of space historians, lovers of space art, and all who seek to understand the evolution of humanity's transition to a space-faring species. Which brings us to Megan Prelinger, an independent historian and lifelong collector of space history ephemera and science fiction literature. She is co-founder and architect of information design of the Prelinger Library, a private research library open to the public uh, here in San Francisco, I believe. Just down the street. Just down the street, which houses more than 40,000 books and other print artifacts on North American regional and land use history, media and cultural studies, and technology, including a space history collection. She is also a naturalist and a rehabilitator of aquatic avian species. She lives and works in San Francisco. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Megan Prelinger. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Wow, that's a, one of the most fulsome introductions ever. We're glad you're here. Okay, okay. Thank you all for uh, sticking through that, too, uh, and uh, hanging out to hear the talk. And I hope you uh, <clears throat> will have some fun. So this uh, project, it started as a project before it was a book. It was about uh, me being really fascinated, kind of a deep-driven history geekish to read, you know, as if they were a novel, uh, issues of Aviation Week and missiles and rockets, just kind of straight through, starting at the very early uh, years of the space era in the mid-1950s. And uh, I was kind of looking for untold stories that might have been contained therein. And uh, just reading the articles, and when I noticed that suddenly, of course, it wasn't sudden. In 57, everything changed. The articles uh, took on an entirely different tone once our, uh, after Sputnik flew, our American space program was suddenly funded and flush with cash. Not only did the stories go from being kind of uh, cautious and hypothetical to being um, dramatic, driven, and uh, visionary, uh, but something else happened on the pages of the papers of the magazines, which is that the advertising really kind of, it sprang to life. It, uh, almost overnight after Sputnik, the ad artwork uh, turned into bold colors and started this process, uh, of this kind of five-year process of cross-fertilization with science fiction literature to start to depict and drive the space program that was coming up ahead. Uh, one of the very earliest kind of uh, visual fixations of artists doing artwork for industry was this, uh, the Vanguard satellite. It was uh, around 
and cute. And uh, it was a showcase for the uh, developing miniaturization of electronics. So it was often depicted um, in this lovely translucence. And I think one reason Voyager was so attractive is that its round shape uh, suggested a little earth, a little moon. It wasn't, um, it was visually quite distinct from say the Explorer satellite that looked like a missile or like a bullet. And there, there was a, a lot of work being done in the um, minds of engineers and artists. And this was at a time when engineers and artists started to work closely with one another to visually differentiate what the peaceful space program would look like as opposed to uh, what was really better funded, the military space program we're all familiar with. And uh, so shapes that um, uh, drew attention towards peaceful exploration tended to have a lot more kind of weight in the visual narrative. And as soon as people, we had the satellites up in the air, the electronics miniaturization uh, enabled satellite technology. Um, people right away started visualizing lunar exploration, and here's a radio set. Uh, it was always closely tied to developments in electronics. Here goes a radio set on the moon. And right along with that was the assumption that uh, human space exploration would be enabled by the technological developments. And um, there was huge excitement, of course, about the prospect of lunar colonization, Martian colonization, these were widely, broadly, roundly discussed at the time. Uh, this is a, an artwork by an artist named Willie Baum, where he's uh, kind of utilizing visual modernism to, de to, be, to, to depict the idea of agriculture on the moon. Uh, but it actually, and here's another Willie Baum, it actually wasn't that simple. Uh, because at the time, there, uh, there wasn't this clear understanding that um, uh, scientific exploration and kind of the cultural value of human exploration were their own separate things. And people tried to convince scientists that human space exploration had the same kind of uh, scientific value as uh, planetary sciences, and there was this uh, kind of uncomfortable attempt to align them. And because of that, human space exploration had actually really suffered as a cultural project. It didn't, um, it, uh, it was under contention. It was uh, politically fraught um, then, you know, no less so than today by majority of people in Congress who didn't want to fund it, uh, majority of scientists who didn't think it should be funded because it wasn't an a, appropriate expression of, uh, of fiscal or technological or scientific resources. And so when I uh, read the article, so I'm reading Missiles and Rockets magazine and watching the uh, visual narrative of these, uh, this advertising artwork go by while reading the stories about how leaders at Caltech and leaders at the at MIT and leaders at the uh, National Science Foundation were all going on record against human spaceflight. And I really started seeing the ads as having their own, um, uh, they're building an ideological narrative that human spaceflight is uh, beautiful and that it's, uh, inevitable and that it's uh, the kind of cultural totality of its significance makes it inescapable and ultimately that kind of cultural totalization expressed in these images uh, did win the day because it they uh, spoke where they needed to speak and uh, President Kennedy funded the space the human spaceflight program but so the advertising was convening this kind of cultural ideology. It was also recruiting engineers at the same time. And so you see these uh, different kinds of uh, dialogues going on. At once, uh, space is uh, peaceful, 
welcoming and inevitable. At the same time, if you're an engineer and you want to be challenged, it's got to also look impossible and look like uh, a series of the, the biggest, most complicated, and most exciting engineering problems that have ever been faced. So you see these, uh, what I came to think of as the precarious astronaut uh, series of images uh, right alongside um, a lot of other uh, you know, visual ideas and narratives that were being promulgated at the same time. And then sometimes I take a break from reading Missiles and Rockets and Aviation Week and go look at something else. And this is in Life magazine. And this is kind of a funny expression of the extent to which our little cultural debate about space exploration um, migrated out into different uh, and became a you know a little driver of different kinds of uh, anxieties or utopian ideas and all kinds of uh, uh, corners of culture and this is an ad for life insurance and it's uh, it kind of it still kills me when I notice that thanks to the gifted book designer this is on the cover of the book because this is, you know, it's not an aerospace ad. It's a, you know, it's a borrowing of the, um, you know, are we in utopia or dystopia if we're floating in space? Um, to uh, tap that little wonder ball in our heads and uh, convince us to buy uh, life insurance. And then the ships started to get designed. And after a while, astronauts were depicted. They're kind of both precarious and safe at the same time. And they're having the grand adventure. I especially like this one, this grand adventure. Uh, so 1959, the era of Bonanza, we're sort of more in a, the era when the space exploration was replacing, uh, you know, narratives of the West and cowboys and stuff like that as uh, our, you know, major stuff of our cultural imagination. And here we are in this one that's like a cabin, and the console is like a stovetop, and the guy in the back is like shaking a cocktail shaker. <laughs> <laughs> and these guys have all the space in the world to float around, and they're off having the grand adventure. One thing I learned about studying these images is that you can actually watch technological change happen in real time um, if you kind of look behind what's behind. And around about 1960, this ad is from late in 1959, and early 1960 in the technical aviation engineering journals, uh, astronautics and aeronautics, suddenly these huge physics proofs are published that um, explain the relationship between volume and cost in space. <laughs> And after those calculations are published, you don't see depictions of spacious uh, space cabins anymore. They so I also learned some things about rocket propulsion. Again, that uh, so along with electronics miniaturization, there were also some really rapid technological changes happening in uh, fuel systems design at the time. And the design of fuel systems was going to feed quite a bit into what interplanetary spacecraft were going to look like. And this ad is kind of a negative example because most of the ones that looked like missiles did not um, did not fly as ideas, as uh, kind of visual narratives. So most artists working with engineers or working with marketing people at engineering firms were, uh, but you know, artists were given access to engineering plans and met with engineers about what they were designing. But a lot of times engineers were still working at the idea level or at the part level. And it was up to the artists to figure out what the whole might end up looking like. 
And so you have some kind of not so missile-like rockets. And then there were these discoveries about uh, you had to have spherical fuel tanks um, because of some of the molecular structures and some of the compounds used in fuels, such as hydrogen, that um, didn't fit well into square or confined spaces very well at all. And suddenly, artists started working and working with the engineers, how are we going to incorporate spheres into the design of rockets that are going to have to theoretically be, to some extent, aerodynamic? Um, and this was an open question, and this open question is, uh, you know, this is the place where, um, you know, art engineering and science fiction uh, merged and swirled together for a few years. Here's another um, rocket in the, it's actually just a pile of spheres, a stack of them, going to the moon, and then this one. How about it? The Christmas tree rocket. This is actually what I thought was going to go on the cover of the book, but I, but I love that cover. But how about that one? Huh? You know. And uh, this act this image is actually the image that gave me the idea for what to call the book, because I realized that the picture was working. It was pulling me in as a as a reader. You know, here are these guys. Are they uh, greeting an arriving ship or waving goodbye to a departing ship? Are they uh, they're looking onto this desert floor with something of a millennial fervor? Um, that taps into a lot of pre-existing stories, and that you know. And then there was this realization that the the uh, pictures were not just pictures, but they were pulling, you know, me and every engineer who was reading the magazines into um, something more than just imagery, but into, uh, into a, a story that was this other, it was this science fiction, another science fiction about real world technological emergence. Sphere rockets, tubes, whoops, yep. And then um, the mid-century modernists come in and they uh, create beautiful abstracts based on the images of the engineers and other artists. At the time, there were some truly science fictional technologies being proposed, one of which would be that there, we could have hybrid uh, nuclear battery and liquid fuel propulsion vehicles that would uh, scoot around effectively in interplanetary space. Here's one idea. They tended to look like uh, X-wing fighter pilots from Star Wars. <laughs> kind of funny. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Star Wars. <laughs> and then, you know, I was a lifelong reader of science fiction. And um, louder? So if you look at science fiction over the decades and centuries, it tends to anticipate uh, technological um, development and often to lead technological development. And I wondered, when I started to focus in on this 1957 to 62 time frame, if uh, science fiction would continue to lead or not. So I took a kind of a fine-grained view and actually compared month by month stories, images, and ideas between magazine of fantasy and science fiction, analog, and, um, and the tech magazines that I was reading. And actually found that in these few years, science fiction had the, there was a reversal of polarity and it, science fiction started to play the role of the follower for, I think, the first time and only for a little while. But so this ad was published in 1959, and then this was a cover of uh, F and SF six months later. And I think there's a direct connection. There were three nuclear rocket programs in the US, um, NERVA, Rover, and Orion. 
Uh, there was some uh, creative visualization of what nuclear rockets would look like, but the questions weren't as broad as with liquid fuels in terms of, you know, there was no question of spheres or anything like that. So you get what we think of as kind of a more conventional rocket shape with these ideas of nuclear rockets, except when we come to this, which is an idea based on an Orion spaceship. So there's a kind of basic idea for a nuclear rocket that it would have uh, a little reactor and it would just uh, lift off and go and it would look like a toothpaste tube and there it is. Uh, Project Orion was something completely different. It was the, an attempt by um, Manhattan Project engineers to arrive at a peaceful application of nuclear bomb technology. And instead of having like one core reactor that runs continuously like a power plant, that this ship would actually be powered by ejecting a series of mini bombs out the back of it and would be propelled by the uh, force of the ex explosion of these bomblets. And this was a real project. It was funded. It was totally highly classified during all the time that it was funded. So when this ad for the atomic pulse rocket saying coyly a similar project is past pilot study in the Defense Department, the Defense Department went to Congress and asked for uh, like veto power over the table of contents of missiles and rockets in Aviation Week magazines and tried to gain an, uh, an injunction against the magazines from publishing anything that was influenced by leaks of classified material. They lost. Um, park here for a minute. This isn't in the book. Um, sorry, you can enjoy it here now. So we didn't get atomic reactor powered uh, rockets. They were uh, politically disabled. Really, as soon as people realized that if you ever had any launch failure, even once ever, that a 10-mile radius around the launch facility would be a dead zone for 100 years, then that was the end of all three of our nuclear rocket programs. Um, but we did develop isotope-powered batteries that are uh, atomic in the sense that they're powered by decay and half-life of isotopes. And they run really well. And they, um, the first one was launched in 1961 on a, a naval navigational satellite. And this is a poster for the Voyager spacecraft, which, as we know, is now approaching the outer limits of the of our solar system and it's isotope powered and it's been isotope powered since it launched 33 years ago. And I just mentioned the isotope batteries because actually right now in the US we have a crisis of isotope fuel and NASA only has enough uh, radioisotope fuel for battery powered planetary exploration spacecraft to fuel half of their planned planetary programs in the next 20 years. So remember, remember that which I used to demonstrate what I really got out of this literature is that it offers a sort of a prism for looking at this relationship between technological fact and science fiction and the past, the present, and the future. The more I learned about history, the more kind of unstuck in time our historical moment of today comes to seem to be, because just as in science fiction, the deeper you get into it, um, the closer tomorrow seems to relate to yesterday, you know? And uh, one case in point is electric propulsion. I actually met this man. Uh, these were real engineers who were photographed looking at a pinch plasma engine in a laboratory. And they, um, they had their names published in the ad. So I was able to look them up and, actually, and make contact and get to know them. And one of them came to my, one of my readings on the East Coast. It was awesome. He was like 90, and it was very sweet. And they also sent me all this literature that helped me understand uh, 
ion drives. Anyway, so ion drives, they tried to test them in the laboratory in the 1950s and tried to test them in the 1960s and tested them in the 1970s and tested them in the 1980s. And because of materials instability problems, they didn't work for the first 45 years that they were developed, no matter how fantastic the spaceships were that, uh, that were imagined to be powered by them. No matter how pretty the pictures were, the materials instability problems kept them from flying until 2001 when the first one flew. Finally, it took 45 years. And uh, once the bugs were work worked out, um, we do rely pretty heavily regularly on, uh, on, um, on these kinds of engines for a satellite and uh, low power interplanetary craft. So, you know, if I'd been reading the uh, news release in 2001 without having done this research, I would have actually, it was reported as new in 2001. And it was just an interesting historical window. You know, new isn't always new. Sometimes it means that somebody worked on it for 45 years. Um, another case, solar sails and space junk. So. Solar sails were uh, kind of widely promulgated utopian promise of swift, fast, and clean interplanetary travel. They're, uh, you know, narrativized by the best of the best, wind from the sun, all about solar-powered spacecraft. At the same time, the utopian impulse embedded in the Civil, the impulse to civil space exploration anticipated the problem of space junk and anticipated strategies for pulling space junk out of orbit at the same time. Now, neither uh, being like green in space nor pursuing technologies that had no military app, neither of those was really marketable or fundable in the 1950s in the Cold War era. So um, initiatives to head off the problem of space junk were not followed up on, not, as were solar sails, just not funded, no military app, no funding. One of the ideas was that there would be rescue vessels in space. And uh, this is a rescue vessel uh, rescuing people who, uh, they're in pretty deep do do if the asteroid just <laughs> just hit their um, their space station where they're living, and then in 2010, a year ago, a year and a couple months ago, the first solar sail was launched by Japan. Thank you, JAXA. Um, this is a provable technology here in the U.S. We've had uh, uh, the Planetary Society has tried to launch solar sail spacecraft, and due to uh, well, technological difficulties from um, using ex-Cold War uh, leftover launch hardware. They had launch failures and the, um, the solar sails were destroyed on launch. Uh, but uh, Japan Space Agency got one up last year. Um, right at the same time was this idea that actually originated in Britain that if we can get uh, solar sails up, we can use them to uh, attack the problem of space junk and attach to, like use the little solar sails, they're called nano sails, attach them to space junk and pull the space junk out of orbit. So, you know, 50 years later, these two uh, ideas, one's just an idea, one's a technology, they actually converge. So 1962, the book starts in 1957 when the advertising started to get really interesting and uh, ends in 1962. What happened, why? That was the year that the design decision for the Apollo spacecraft, including the lunar lander, was announced. And it was an engineering solution, and it didn't address any of the visual romanticism of a rocket landing on the moon. In fact, it didn't end up addressing any of the visual romance of space exploration at all. It was this. <laughs> uh, 
And that was, it was really the beginning of the end. So it was that, it was this design decision, and there just wasn't really a way to pretty it up. <laughs> and there was also the, the kind of uh, just hard fact that once the engineering work and design had gone into first Mercury, then Gemini, and then Apollo, um, all the budgets were plateaued and stopped growing and recruitment slacked off. So this all happened at the same time and the two were tied together. Designers did still kind of try to make the Apollo visually interesting through a little minimalism here and there, but it didn't work. Um, but we did go to the moon. One thing that we do besides uh, run our print library is uh, historic film archives. And we collect, my partner back there is the lead collector of home movies. And this is actually, I like to show this when I talk about another science fiction because um, both the book and this movie express a level of uh, kind of um, heartfelt participation in space exploration that we need to bring back. And um, this is a home movie of the lunar landing shot off the TV. So, you know, I'm showing it not just to show that this is what it looked like when we went to the moon, but the film itself is this piece of evidence of a, a time when uh, you know, people would have had their 8 and 16 millimeter cameras out, stuck them on a tripod and aimed it at the TV to hold the moment. Also, once um, we knew what the rockets and the hardware were really going to look like, and once there was an astronaut core, uh, the live astronaut core kind of took the place of the, the uh, live color TV pictures of the moon. <laughs> if you had color TV in 1969, not that many people did. But, um, you know, the charisma of the astronauts and their stories kind of took the place of what the... Uh, sci-fi romantic advertising had done and spoke to a broader public. A word about the artists. Most of these artists were making work for industry and were not necessarily allowed to sign their work and were an, and remain anonymous. Some artists had enough of their own identity. Frank Tinsley was a, a writer as well as an artist. And I came to realize in the course of the research that a lot of the fantastical and utopian ideas expressed in his artwork probably originated with him and were less a part of what any one firm was actually doing. Uh, this was confirmed uh, when I was given this book for my birthday. Um, you know, Tinsley, he wrote it as well as illustrated it. The illustrations are fantastic, but, you know, he's not shy. You know, with his vision. Not shy at all. The first million years. You know, all right. He's, uh, you know, he should have been a long now fellow. <clears throat> and then uh, the work of Willie, Willie Baum, which really stands out visually. He's a classically trained Swiss modern graphic designer. did absolutely spectacular work. So I tried to find these artists, and I tried to, I discovered in my dismay that Frank Tinsley died in 1964, uh, long before I was born or even before the, the moon landing, so we never got to see any of that. And if I'd been a better researcher, it might not have taken me four years, but I did find Willie and, uh, and he turned out to live only five miles from me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we got to be friends. 
and uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Today our future in space is in our hands. This is a home movie made by a guy named Robert Barnes who built all the models, you know, from model kits himself. And with string, he animated them and he told the story in his own movie. And this is kind of where, you know, we're back today. We're going to build our, the future of our space program and maybe even go to Mars. Um. <laughs> yeah, perfect landing. Whatever we do from now as a society, we're, it's going to be built with our own hands. We're not um, from here on out. And that's my talk. I did get to go to the shuttle launch last month, <laughs> which was one of the most amazing things I've ever done. And that's the end. So thank you. Questions? Oh, come on. Yeah. So I can't help but wonder if there's a, a parallel period of history here in the Valley, which is, you know, the boom years in Silicon Valley, and you have, you know, similar trade magazines that also no longer exist, uh, you know, uh, uh, new, new bit, uh, what were they called? Um, I've been a while since I've seen them. Uh, but, you know, there was a, Again, sort of optimism about uh, progress and about what can be built and so forth. And uh, I'm curious if that's like sort of another, the, if there's parallels and also interesting differences between those. I think I mean, what comes to mind is that it's harder to visualize what we were what, going to be building. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. no one predicted Google right. as it is now, even then. Right. Exactly. So, but, there are definitely economic. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. Could you repeat the question so that we get on the table? Oh right. Um, the question was whether uh, there are parallels between uh, Silicon Valley cycles of uh, of boom boomtown eras and uh, and the space boom era, and there are definitely you know what are the similarities and differences? There are definitely economic similarities and that are t closely tied with economic similarities. I think in the um, in the Cold War era, you know, the the economics was more of an external to the technology. The technology was reliant on a lot of uh, outside funding from the Cold War economic surplus. And uh, you know, in the tech boom years, it has seemed like you know the technology drove its own boom rather than having a boom imposed on it from the outside. So that's the main difference I see. And of course, yeah, there's a big difference in how technology is visualized today because we can lend a design to concepts and phenomena, you know, like Google, so like a phenomena, um, more than, you know, object, exactly. Yeah. Yes? Um, so uh, I was curious what you're working on since you finished this book, aside from uh, giving talks about the book itself. Are you on to similar projects, or are you maybe working on another book? The question is, what am I working on now? And uh, yes, I can't, I uh, don't want to get anybody too excited, except I'm so excited. But um, <laughs> they won't be out for like at least probably three more years. But um, it's, I couldn't fit a space electronics chapter into this book. The material on space electronics was larger than could fit in any chapter format in this book, and it's become its own book. It's called Inside the Machine Electronics in the Modern Century, forthcoming in 2014 from W.W. Norton, and that's what I'm working on. Another project of a life, I mean, I thought this was a project of a lifetime, but um, I'm, you know, 110% as excited and engaged with that as I was with this, so, yeah. Yeah, questions? Thank you. Thank you. This is a lot of fun.